The fun problem we're going to solve is to build a robot that moves around in a box. And so we're going to have walls around our robot. And we're going to place it. So the problem we're going to solve today is what happens when the robot approaches a wall. So here's our stick figure robot. And it is moving in this direction. And when it hits the wall, we're going to make it rotate so it follows along the wall. And similarly, if the robot is traveling in the other direction, relative to the wall, there's our robot, and it is traveling in this direction, we're going to turn in the other direction and follow the wall that way. In order to make this happen, uh, the robot's going to need a way to move. So we're going to place two stepper motors on the wheels uh, such that if the stepper motors are both turned in the same direction, it will move. So if the stepper motors are rotating, it will move. The second thing we're going to have to add is sensors. And so we're going to add two sensors, two bump sensors, on the front of the robot so I can tell, so I can tell if I've hit the wall. So in the, in the scenario at the top, you mean that when it hits the wall, it's going to be the left sensor that's going to strike the wall first. Okay, that's right. So if the left sensor hits first, we are then going to turn right. Conversely, if the right sensor hits first, we will then turn left. So how are we going to interface this robot to our microcontroller? Let's begin with the battery. Because we have motors, we're not going to hook up the, <coughs> the launch pad to the motors. We'll use a battery. This will protect the launch pad when the motors draw too much current. Oh, excellent, excellent, yes. <laughs> In order to make the launch pad run, we'll use a regulator. And this will change our 8.4 volts from the battery into 5 volts and we'll tie that to VBUS to our launch pad. And the ground goes to ground. So now the battery's running the launch pad. To interface the motors, what I'm going to need is a motor driver. And so I'm going to use two uh, L293s to drive the motor. And the motors Stepper motors have two coils, A and B. We have two L293s because we have two stepper motors, the left stepper motor and the right stepper motor. And we're going to connect or control the, the motors with a parallel output port. And so this is going to be PB7 through PB4, and this is the right motor and we're going to have PB3 through PB0, four pins going to the left motor. It's very important to watch the current. The current across the motors is going to come from the battery connected to my L293s, go across the coil, out the ground pins, and back to the motor. And this current here, across these coils, does not pass through the, the launch pad or the microcontroller. So it goes directly from the battery to the driver, out the ground of the driver, and back to the battery. What about the inputs, John? Oh, yeah, we've got to connect up to inputs, don't we? We've got two bump sensors, and we're going to tie them to PE0 and PE1. The left bump sensor is going to go to PE1, and the right bump, bump sensor will go to PE0. These are going to be positive logic. Again, if the right bumper hits, this will be a 1. If the left bumper hits, this will be a 1. 
So this, these are similar to the switches we saw, except they have they look more like bump sensors and not switches. Yeah, just like those. Let's look at how the microcontroller controls the stepper motors. The stepper motors each have two coils, two windings. One is called A and one is called B. There are four pins which output to the motors. If we output a five, which is going to be a zero, one, zero, one, we see that current across the coil A will go up because there's a one here and a zero there. Similarly, the current will go up across the B coil. If we now change the output to a six, what that will do is that will flip the current on the B coil. The B coil is now going to have current which goes down. The A, coil, the A current still goes up. This step is going to affect a change in the motor. And so if this is the motor here, and we look at the angle that this motor is at, this change from five to a six will cause the motor to rotate by a angle, which is determined by the physics of the motor. In our case, this angle is going to be 1.8 degrees. So when I buy stepper motors, I choose my stepper motor based on what angle uh, it has to rotate in each step that I write to the stepper motor. Yes, this one has 200 steps per rotation. Well, we're not done. We have two more. If we output a 10, what will happen is we're going to rotate or flip the current on the other motor. And so now, because the A coil sees a 1, 0, its current will go down. The B coil is still 1, 0, so it is also going down. And the motor will rotate one more time of 1.8 degrees. We got one more, and that is a 9 which is a one, zero, zero, one. You see, each time we step it, we're flipping one of the currents in one of the coils. Again, the A coil remained down, one, zero, but the B coil flipped to be a zero, one. This pattern of five, six, 10, nine is repeated over and over and over again. So it goes five, six, 10, nine, five, six, ten, nine, repeat it over and over again. Each time we step to a new value, it rotates 1.8 degrees. So it goes from a five, six, ten, nine, five, six, ten, nine, it rotates. So in order to move both motors clockwise, we're going to output the pattern 55, 66, 10, 10, 9, 9, over and over again. The speed at which it rotates is going to be 1.8 degrees divided by the time in between outputs. So in summary, with a stepper motor, we can control both the position of the shaft by stepping at 5, 6, 10, 9. And we can also control the speed at which it runs by varying the time between steps. So let's build the finite state machine. So we're going to do a state transition graph, but first we'll have to fill in all the elements of our finite state machine, all which right. is uh, in the set of inputs. Inputs. And we saw here we have PE1 and PE0 are our inputs. Then we have our set of outputs. Okay. We have outputs, which we saw were PB7 through PB0. And then we have the set of states. Ah, states. Okay. We're going to have lots of states in our finite state machine. Okay. 
Okay. So the states will correspond to all the all the configurations we can find the um, the robot in. Okay. So we will use the states to specify what we know, what we believe to be true. Two more. And then we need the state transition graph, which is going to tell us how we move from one state to another. Okay. So, for instance, if no switches are pressed, no bumpers are pressed, we are going to go in this direction and move. There's one more, and that is output determination. Output determination will cause something to happen. So we're going to use the outputs to change our world. And in particular, we saw to move the robot forward, we're going to output a 55, 66, AA, and 99. That will rotate the motor forward. But what if I want to rotate the uh, robot backwards? Oh, backwards. To go backwards, in other words, if both bumpers are hit, I can actually rotate the motor in the other direction. So if I output a 99AA6655, because both sensors were hit, both motors will rotate in the other direction, and the robot will go backward. If I hit the right bumper, I want to turn left. And we can turn left by rotating one of the steppers in one direction and the other in the other direction. So we see here that one motor is going 5, 6, 10, 9, while the other is going 5, 9, 10, 6. And that will turn the robot left. If I want to go right, in other words, if the other switch is hit, and I want to turn right, I'll reverse it. In this way, one motor is going 5, 9, 10, 6, and the other is going 5, 6, 10, 9. And this will turn right. Again, the speed in which I rotate the motors is dependent on the delta t, the time between outputs. So I can choose the speed in degrees per second by specifying the time between states. So, so one of the things we want to make sure when we have a state transition graph is we, uh, we will indicate um, every label, every arrow has to be labeled, uh, which means that we have to account for all inputs in all states. So, John, will you complete the graph? Of course. Okay. So, in this case, regardless of what the input's going to be, I'm going to rotate a whole way around. And over here, regardless of what this one is, I'm going to rotate around. And so you can see the decision will be made when it gets to the top state. Uh, similarly here, um, this one is 1-1, uh, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, and this one is going to be a 0-1, 0-1. And this is going to be 0, 0-1, 1-0, 0-0. 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. So we specified for every state all possible next states. So each state has four next states.